Acts chapter 10, starting with verse 34. And when you have it, please stand. Acts 10, 34. <clears throat> Hear ye the word of the Lord. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did in both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses. And who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. God's word for God's people and God's people said amen. amen. For uh, the time that is ours, you may be seated. For the time that is ours to share together, I want to talk a little bit about the conversion of Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius was the them along with Cornelius' household that Peter was talking to in the text. Uh, one thing I love about scripture is that scripture has stood the test of time. We can't remember what uh, the popular songs were on the radio from six months ago or last year, but the word of God has stood the test of time. Amen. It remains strong. Uh, I find it funny that the newest forms of uh, social media I haven't really gotten into them, but the most popular ones out there now are all about temporariness. Is that a word? I don't know. I just made it up. <laughs> They're all about the temporary or being anonymous. Uh, the most popular by far is Snapchat. Snapchat allows you to take pictures and videos and send it to a list that you can control but you can also control how long they can look at that picture. Uh, and if you try to make copies of it, it alerts the person that tried to. If you try to save the picture to your own phone, they let you know. Snapchat. Those pictures or those videos are known as snaps. There's another one uh, called uh, Yik Yak. Yik Yak. Uh, looks at your phone and you can set a radius to it and it will let you know people who have Yik Yak on their phone within a 10 mile radius or a one and a half mile radius and you're able to chat to them anonymously. There are others like Post Secret and Whisperer. And then there's another one that's on the rise called What. It's spelled W-U-T and this allows you to send messages to your Facebook friends anonymously which I don't really understand because if you Facebook friends I would want you to anyway okay. but these things are so popular because people from other generations have had emails exposed and 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 uh, phone calls recorded and videos that they thought were on their phone only shared all over the place so the next generation has decided well what's going to make it popular is, is if we make it temporary. Uh, but here's a funny thing, though, about Snapchat and a couple of the other ones, and especially since I work in technology, anything you put on an electronic device is never really gone. And uh, Forbes is actually, a couple other people, Forbes reported that Snapchat doesn't actually delete your devices. It doesn't delete the pictures. It keeps almost up to your last 200 pictures and videos 
but that's a selling point that you can say something and it gets deleted and nobody else will get to see it. But the word of God still stands from things that happened 2,000 years ago. The word still stands and the information still got out and that is why we are here this morning celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Uh, In the text, we have just as much of the conversion of Cornelius as we do of the Apostle Peter. Acts 10, if you read, the, the, in order to uh, fully understand what was going on in Acts 10, 34 through uh, 43, you'd have to start at the beginning of Acts chapter 10. There's a a man by the name of Cornelius. He's a centurion. He's a God-fearer. He's not necessarily a full worshiper. He's not a part of a Jewish synagogue nor is he following Jesus, but he is God-fearing, and so is the rest of his household, and he had a vision. And the vision from God told him to go find a man from Joppa and have him come to his house. And that man from Joppa happened to be Peter, who happened to also have a vision at the same time in a different city uh, where it said, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Well, God put all this spread out on, on, on a, a table in front of him, the, the things that you know you weren't supposed to eat at the time, the, uh, the pork and the shellfish and a certain kind of four-foot, four-hooved uh, animals and wings. And he told him to eat. And he said, by no means, because I've never let anything unclean into my mouth. But God told him, don't call anything I've made unclean. Uh... So you have two people in opposite cities having a vision that lets them know that they're supposed to meet with each other. Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And don't call anything I've made unclean. Uh, I'm going to stop right there for a moment. I have a little bit of a pet peeve. It's kind of been bothering me. I figure I'll let it out now. I, I deal... You say everybody's ministry is supposed to be about uh, where their misery is at. And I would guess my misery is at losing people that were originally growing up in the church to other people that tend to know the Bible a little more better than them. Uh, I've, I've seen quite a few people join the Nation of Islam because the brother with the bow ties and the bean pies could quote the Bible better than the pastor that they were sitting up under. And I I put this note about rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Because one of those verses that they always talk about is if you really follow the Bible, why are you eating shellfish? Why are you eating? It's almost crawfish season. And I'll just pray for everybody's support in the spirit because I got a shellfish allergy and I can't really eat crawfish. So y'all have what y'all want. I ain't bitter or nothing. (laughs) But, um... One of the verses that they always quote is, why are you wearing mixed fabric? Why are you eating pork? Why are you uh, eating shellfish? Because all those things you ain't supposed to do. Well, yes and no. See, there's a difference between what you call the moral law and, and the ceremonial law. The moral laws, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, those kind of laws were put in the Bible for how we were supposed to act. And then there were what you call ceremonial laws that were put in place for how you were supposed to dress and what kind of diet you were supposed to do and what kind of things you were doing in anticipation of a savior. So those ceremonial laws were only for uh, a certain amount of time until we got to the ceremony. So now that Jesus is here, You don't necessarily need to follow the ceremonial laws anymore, just like you wouldn't put a flyer up for a party that's already happened. It's there. You may run across them. You may see them, but there's a purpose there. So rise, Peter, kill, and eat this conversion of Peter. Peter, at the time, was not about letting anybody who wasn't Jewish into the way. They didn't call them Christians at the time. They might have called them followers of Jesus, but it was the way. He felt this was the next step for Judaism. And this 
So somebody who wasn't born Jewish or wasn't a Jewish person, certainly I wasn't finna, he wasn't about to tell them about Jesus because they weren't a part of it. But he changed his opinion. He called them unclean at first. He would have called a centurion unclean because they were Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers with a lot of wealth and a lot of soldiers under them. You mean to tell me that I'm going to tell this person who is oppressing me? Almost like the police do right now about Jesus. He changed his mind. So anyway, when I think about rise, Peter, kill, and eat, I think about the conversion, and I also think about what it means, because people use that against you. Anyway, ceremonial laws and moral laws, two different things with two different purposes. And here we have somebody understanding that and kind of seeing that in their conversion. So Peter decides to go. And not only does he decide to go to meet up with this Roman centurion, but he stays in the house of a tanner. And, and by tanner, I don't mean like sun tanning. I mean this person worked with animal hides. So here you are with somebody who was the utmost about being clean, staying in a house of somebody who's unclean or would have been deemed unclean because they work with animals, going to go see somebody else who was deemed unclean working with uh, the Roman soldier. you got to change how you think about that. You know, if we're about to uh, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, we got to treat people outside the church. we got to stop treating people outside the church rather like a public restroom. We don't touch them. You know how you use a public restroom. You wash your hands and you dry them. And then as you walk out, you, you know, open the door with your foot or with your elbow or they put the little deal out because you don't want to touch them. But it's 6.3 million people in the metropolitan area of Houston, but only 400,000 go to church. So that's 5.9 million people who don't care for Jesus or don't know about Jesus. And we out here talking about, well, they'll find their way to the church eventually. That's not how it works. We have to go out. We have to go to them. Peter went to them to convert them, as should we. And he brought the message of the gospel. Let the church say message. message. Said that God shows no partiality. Jesus is Lord of all. Text says every nation and here on this day, we have a world full of Gentiles, people who were not born Jews, happy, celebrating something that a Jewish rabbi did. It impacted nations. The Bible says in Philippians 2, chapter, 10, uh, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and in those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord of all. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter what kind of car you have. Don't matter the number of people you have working up under you. Jesus is still Lord. Amen? Amen. And so as a centurion, Cornelius would have had a lot of money and power and a large household. As it says, not only him but his household. He would have been somebody. But that stuff you take is only, you take it at face value. It's on the surface. That's why they use the word partiality sometimes. And in some translations, it says respecter of persons. It literally means face taker. You take or accept someone's face. You take or accept what is on face value. It's a superficial appearance. Or it, it implies something else. But God is not a respecter of persons. God does not play favoritism. God is not concerned about your material wares. The Bible talks a lot about money. It does. But when it talks about money, it's more about your own behavior and your attitude towards money. Not that you should get as much money as you can. Not that you should ask for $65 million for a jet. Shots fired. <clears throat> the Bible talks a lot about it and favoritism. It says in James chapter 2, verses 1 through four, it says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality. 
For if there are some that should come to your assembly, a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and he should come to a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and then the poor man, you sit here there or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? It shouldn't matter what the person wears. It's interesting when we talk about appearance and how much people focus on it. I saw a documentary or a video once where they took these world-class orchestra musicians and they would play the violin or the cello or whatever and they'd put them on the street dressed like they were homeless and saw how the people treated them. Now these were people who people would pay thousands upon thousands of dollars to go see in a, in a concert but on the street, they got absolutely no respect because people were respecting the person. They were respecting how they looked. We have to get past that if we want to advance the kingdom. The Bible says in James chapter 2, further down in 8 and 9, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors says love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbor when you feel like it. It doesn't say love your neighbor if your neighbor can do something else for you. It doesn't say love your neighbor if they got the kind of car you want or the kind of house you want to live in. It just says love your neighbor. Man. Goes on in Colossians to say in, three, in Colossians 3, 22 to 25, bond servants, obey all things in your masters according to the flesh and not with eye service as men pleasers but sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Amen. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. For he who does wrong will be paid for what he's done for there is no partiality. Partiality, favoritism, respect of a person. We ought to be able to treat all people equally Amen. and love them. If that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. That was the message of the gospel. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And he shows no partiality. And so Peter gave him the message of the gospel. And then he talked about the Messiah of the gospel. Let the church say Messiah. Messiah. Jesus went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed by the devil. You know, being Christian means someone who follows Christ. Let's see what Christ did. He went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed by the devil. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's in the Bible. That's, yeah. Yeah, it's it. It's it. I, I think I read it. I think I did. Yeah, yeah. He went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed. <laughs> Are we doing that? Are we doing good? Are we healing the oppressed? Are we fighting the devil and resisting his works? Or do we just concern ourselves with what the church can do for us? <laughs> I kind of chuckle to myself when I run into people who have left a particular ministry or have left a particular church, and it's always the same thing. I'm not getting fed. I'm just not getting fed there. I'm not getting fed at XYZ Church. So I'm going to ABC Church. And, you know, sometimes that could really be a, a, a valid reason because you want to sit under good Bible teaching. Amen. If you want to call yourself a Christian, you got to know what Christians are and what Christians do. And so I can, I can respect leaving because you're not getting fed. But the problem is, is every person I've ever heard say that it's not that they weren't getting fed. It was that somebody or someone in the church and some sort of authority stopped catering to them personally. You know, I really wanted to be leader over this ministry and pastor appointed somebody else. So now I'm mad. And what's really going on is I'm mad. So I don't want to listen to the pastor no more. And that's why I'm not getting fed. Because I don't care what the pastor has to say anymore. I want it to be this or I want it to be that. I want my name on the cornerstone. I want it this, that, and the third. I'm not getting fed. We're concerned about what the church does for us. The measure of effectiveness for a church is, is would anybody miss the church if it closed down? And I'm not just talking about 
family and friends. I'm not just talking about the people who came. I'm talking about the actual community surrounding you. Peter wasn't going to his friend's house to preach. He went to another city for another man that he'd never met before, but God told him to go. He went out. You're going to preach about the Messiah of the gospel. You got to do what the Messiah did and go out. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of just the walls of the church. So Peter talked about the message of the gospel and he talked about the Messiah of the gospel. And the text goes on to talk about the ministers of the gospel. Let the church say ministers. It says in 39 through 42 that they saw what Jesus did and went and spread the word. The apostles saw Christ crucified. They saw him go around and be raised from the dead. It talks about the message. And I always like it because every time I read particularly Acts and the words of Peter, <laughs> somewhere along there, he's going to close or when he's talking or he's preaching, he gives that good old school clothes. You know, you had the preachers that no matter what verse they started in, we knew towards the end we were going to Friday morning <laughs> on a hill called Calvary and taking the Savior and hanging him up on a tree. I'm, I'm still in the Bible. I'm right at verse 39. We are witnesses to all he did in both Jerusalem and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. So we always hear when Peter talks that Friday morning on the hill called Calvary and, and then he died. Didn't he die? Yeah, he, he, he died until the moon was dipped in blood. He died until the veil was torn. He died until the earth reeled and rocked like a natural man. And if you had an old school preacher, they put their finger in their ear and kick their leg up and say, Arr! I can't do it. I'm not going to. But uh, early, early one Sunday morning, he got up and all power in his hand. And we can joke about it, but that's what we need to talk about. Amen. <laughs> the ministers of the gospel saw what Jesus did. They saw him die. They saw him laid in the tomb and they saw him raised from the dead. Talked about the pet peeve about people using, you know, scriptures out of context and trying to use it to convert Christians who may not understand the context of the, of the text other problem I have is not only with people outside of Christianity, I have a problem with people inside Christianity. Hallelujah. And it's been, and I've, it's been getting, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the more time I spend in seminary, the angrier I get. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the late 90s, a bunch of Bible scholars and theologians got together. And I, 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 was, I was reminded of it because I saw it in a devotional I got on Friday from one of the devotionals I read, but in the late 90s, a group of scholars got together to evaluate whether or not Jesus actually said and did some of the things that he's attributed to Scripture. Now, some of the criteria they used, I was like, might make sense, but some of it was, was in, uh, 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 I would question whether or not they actually believe in Jesus at all, uh, whether or not they, they're just here to be, to, 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 uh, because that's job security. But the devotional read, in the late 90s, a group of scholars assembled to evaluate whether Jesus actually said things attributed to him by the gospel writers. Although they employed remarkably subjective criteria in their evaluation of scripture, members of the self-appointed Jesus seminar were widely quoted by the media as authorities on Christian faith. Uh, Marcus Borg, a Jesus seminar leader, said this of Christ's resurrection. As a child, I took it for granted that Easter Sunday meant Jesus literally rose from the dead. I now see Easter differently for me. For me, it is irrelevant whether or not the tomb was empty, whether Easter involved something remarkable happening in the physical or, or to the, happening to the physical body of Jesus is irrelevant. So in a nutshell, you run into a bunch of people that don't believe Jesus actually rose from the dead. There are people who believe that it was a spiritual resurrection. There are people that believe that it was just some sort of 
mysticism between the apostles and they all came together and the Holy Spirit took over them and then in their minds he was released, he was raised from the dead. There are people out there in pulpits. <laughs> there are people out there in seminary getting educated to go to pulpits that don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Let that sink in. These are the preachers of the gospel. God's only son provides eternal life out there questioning whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. Going to get full-time jobs, pastor in churches, get benefits, get pensions, be responsible for several churches because you know they move Methodist pastors around, so they're going to go all over the Texas, I mean, any other conference, not Texas, any <laughs> conference. They, they're going to go all over these conferences with that kind of Backwater doctrine. They don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Don't believe there was any blood on the cross. Don't believe that he actually suffered. We just all imagined he suffered. And it's part of this whole deal to water down the Christian faith. I keep hearing about people looking for how we can change what we're doing to present to the people because what we're doing is not working you know we got to change up church we got to come up with some new kind of song we got to come up with some new kind of this new kind of service new kind of pastor but i don't see any other religions doing that i don't i don't see any any other uh muslim imam telling Let's figure out how to take all the stuff we don't like about Islam out of Islam so that we can get more people. No, no. They're giving what they believe, and you got to deal with it or move on. Amen. I don't see Buddhists trying to water down their faith. I don't see any other faith trying to water it down. But when we come to Christianity, we talking about tolerance and ecumenism or ecumenical uh, 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 relations and let, let whoever in your pulpit to say whatever they want. I, I don't, I can't get with that. And I personally can't get with it because every church that I see operate like that, unless they start off with millions of dollars, they've all closed. <laughs> every church that I've seen come out with this mentality of changing the way we're doing this, they're closed. Meanwhile, I done seen some good Bible teaching old school churches go for going to the thousands. I've read articles in CNN about how a lot of the millennials are going to Orthodox churches because there's no watered down Orthodox pastor. They're going to give it to you the way you want, the, the way it's said, and you just got to deal with it. But that's what we do. But all the and, and, and one of those things that they keep worrying about is, is whether or not Jesus died and rose from the dead. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about that. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with uh, verse 12. That's 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> Verse 12. <clears throat> Let's see what the Bible has to say about this whole whether or not Jesus rose from the dead thing. <clears throat> Starting at verse 12. Now if Christ is preached... That he has been raised from the dead. How do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then the witness of God, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. And yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and Christ is not risen. Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. <laughs> then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If this is the life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all the most pitiful. 
and goes on to say, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But since man came by death and man also came by resurrection of the dead, for as I as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall be made alive. But each one to his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are at Christ that is coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all who rule by authority and power, for he must reign until the last enemy is under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are subject to him, when the Son himself will also be subject to him, who put all things under him, that God may be in all. There are many that try to rationalize what happened on what we celebrate this, this day. Not only this day, but his death and resurrection in general. I'm tired of watching Christians attempt to please people who cannot be pleased anyway. I get tired of watching Christians try to conform to peer pressure as if that's the reason the church is losing its members. It's funny, I, I, we keep seeing all of this, these new age churches and these new age pastors and these, they're they trying to change everything around. And again, I say the only ones that are lasting are the ones that are a spinoff of a big traditional church. If that big traditional, or they call them big steeple churches, go ahead and put a couple million dollars behind a new church plant and make it different, then they'll last. But if you try to make a church like that last on its own, to be like Chris Rock said, grand opening, grand closing. <laughs> Can't stay longer than a dance club opening up in the hood. Open and close. I saw a 30-second video the other day titled, How to Be Better Than 90% of the Other Preachers Today. 22, about 28, 25, 28 seconds of it was uh, intro music, you know, in in an intro track, in a title, and how to be better than other preachers. Then it cut to the pastor, and the pastor said, Christ died for you. And then it cut to the outro music, and that's how to be better than 90% of the pastors. What they were getting at is that we've gotten so watered down that we don't preach the gospel. And what is the gospel? Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead so that we could have a way to heaven. That's not preached in a lot of places. And it's funny because I was asked in seminary where I'm repeatedly getting angered every day. Somebody asked me when I was going on one of my tirades whether or not I liked a particular preacher or not. And I said that it's not that I don't like them. I don't knock their hustle, but that's just not what I want right now. When I'm looking to hear a preacher preach, I feel like it's too much to ask, but what I want is for the pastor to open the Bible, take a text, walk down the text, staying in the text, don't mix in your book you wrote, don't mix in the new popcorn theology. Don't mix in the songs. Don't, don't try to make it. I mean, I understand you want to reach the people where they're at. I understand that. But I think we, it's people out there doing that that don't have any God behind it. There are churches that are churches of atheism that meet on Sunday. They got music. They got praise and worship. They got offering. They tell you where the offering's going. It's going out to help another community. And they got somebody that stands up and talks a little bit for about 20 or 30 minutes every Sunday. But ain't no Jesus nowhere. And it's a church of atheists. So I think we should get behind that. So I say when I'm looking for something, just take a text. Walk down the text. And then tell me about Jesus at the end. That's, that's all I want. And I feel like that's too much to ask. But I have to ask. If preaching that Christ was crucified dead and raised from the dead was good enough for a Cornelius. And it was good enough for all the people that became Christians way back then. And it's been working up until now. Why try to change it? 
because it says in verse 43, all the prophets testify, prophets testify about him and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. That name of Jesus. That name above all names. That name that causes demons to flee. That name that causes every enemy to bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus is Lord because he lives. Because I serve a risen Savior. And he's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy and I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. Who's that he? Christ. Christ lives today. He walks with me and talks with me a long life's never way. He lives. He lives salvation to impart. And you ask me how I know he lives? Because he lives right in my heart. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come. Amen.